evening, brothers and sisters. We got a groovy episode of Motophiliacs TV for you today. That's right. We're going to review this bad Cadillac CTS. We're going to have world news, road rage, and we're going to get our hands dirty on 11 Jetta. I think the band may be coming to take us away. We better book it. Watch this video, you dig? I want to talk to you about Cadillac and how their cars have influenced millions of car guys and gals over a number of decades. Now Ron will talk to you about global market impact, features, specifications, and, and many, many maths. But I, no, I, I will speak to you as a fellow gearhead, as a custom car lover, as a purveyor of all things low riding, and as an unadulterated fan of American luxury cars. Here's a statement. Cadillac is now making tremendously wonderful cars that most importantly are cool. Odd? I don't think so. Let me explain. As a car guy, and a North American one at that, I know of a time when Cadillac was a trend-setting automaker loved by Hollywood actors, rock stars, and Las Vegas elite. They've been immortalized in film and print, and they've served as an icon for lowriders, custom car builders, and retirees everywhere. Okay, the last one was there basically for chuckles. Anyway. Cadillacs influenced a generation of car designers early on, and they were the benchmark for luxury automobiles in North America. Cool guys drove caddies, and that fun was synonymous with style and flair. One day, though, all of a sudden, it wasn't was called the mid-80s and the 90s. Cars were poorly made, stylishly impotent, and just all around bad. And automaking in general was poor and sad, but for Cadillac it was especially so. Do you remember this list of who's who's? The Cimarron, the Elante, Caprice-based Fleetwoods, and most horribly front-wheel drive DeVilles. Now, that sounds terrible, but it, it wasn't all doom and gloom, though. Upon entering the new millennium, the cars were a bit soulless and lacked direction, but they were on to something. Something spiritual, something interesting. It took them a decade, but by 2010, Cadillac was showing signs of life. Focused, sharp-looking life. The second-generation CTS was midlife, and the range included the CTS-V, a ham-fisted brawler with a luxurious soul introduced just two years prior. Car guys could be passionate about caddies again. High performance, luxurious, and styled aggressive for increased street cred. A couple years further on would bring us the CTS-V Coupe, a car I personally loved to death. Massaged Corvette motor, almost 600 horsepower. It stormed the luxury coupe market, signifying GM and its Cadillac brand was truly back. They had found an identity. They know who they were, and more importantly, they know who they wanted to sell cars to. Luxury, high-performance cars with a world market appeal, a lot of technology, and stylish luxury. So, now that you're on my wavelength, now you're feeling my mojo, I want you to take a look at this. <laughs> Thank you. 
Cadillacs I remember from my formative years in the 80s and 90s were frankly uninspiring and soft land yachts. I was never a fan of the Mark. The CTS was first introduced in 2002, and while I respect Cadillac's bold step to introduce something quite different to the market, the styling never appealed to me. It was sharp and angular and boxy. My aesthetic sensibility leans towards swoopy, curvy, and sexy. Fast forward to 2014, though, and this third generation CTS, and it was like a swan that hatched out of a turkey's egg. The styling of this third generation is still somewhat angular, and it still has sharp lines, but it's much more sculpted and sleeker. It's less boxy. This is actually a good looking car that I find pleasing to my eye. Even better though than the looks is the performance. Cadillac has made huge progress and now have a worthy contender in the luxury performance sedan wars. This car is lighter than its predecessor and the weight balance is near 50-50. The steering is sharp and perfectly weighted. It feels like a very good sports car, not like a big mid-size luxury sedan. The suspension has magnetic dampers that adjust to the road a thousand times per second. It's compliant and just firm enough in touring mode. But put the car in sport mode and it stiffens up and turns the car into a serious canyon carver. I was able to hold some seriously impressive speed on long flowing highway on-ramps and throw it into sharp corners with little to no protest from the tires. Our car came equipped with a 3.6 liter six cylinder engine. It puts out a healthy 335 horsepower and 285 pound-feet of torque. The exhaust growl sounds great too, and this car really encourages you to mash the throttle and experience the sound and acceleration. It's really a blast to drive. So now that I've come across like a schoolgirl with a crush, I will say that it's not perfect. I do have a few small criticisms. The transmission shifts at low speed, especially when turning sharply, can feel a bit harsh. The car does come with a nice auto shutoff feature that keeps it from idling at stoplights, but the engine restart can also feel a bit harsh. It's not as smooth as I've experienced in other cars. I'm also not a fan of the slightly fiddly touch sensitive buttons that the climate controls and stereos have. They don't feel great and sometimes don't respond to inputs. I prefer a more analog control with real buttons. Rear seat space is also a bit tight and my feet feel really cramped under the front seats when I'm back there. It's not a place I would want to be for a long road trip. And finally, given the car's excellent cornering ability, I could have used bigger side bolsters on the front seats, but that's really a minor quibble. So how does this car stack up in the mid-size luxury market? Well, the base CTS comes with a 2-liter turbo engine producing 265 horsepower and starts at around $51,000. At the higher end, you have the CTS V-Sport that houses a twin-turbo V6 that produces 420 horsepower and 430 pound-feet of torque. As I said, ours was the middle of the range with the 335 horsepower six-cylinder, and it starts at a little over 70,000. Our really well-equipped example bumped that up to about just under 74,000. The Mercedes E-Class starts higher at 65.5 for the 248 horsepower E300. The price for the similarly powered E400 is $72,900 and maxed out with some options you're looking at about $75,600. But really the Mercedes doesn't offer as many bells and whistles or technology in the E-Class as you find in the CTS. A base 535 X-Drive starts higher at around $60,000. But once you option it out to have a lot of the same features as the CTS, you're up to a significantly higher $87,600. And it has about 10% less horsepower at 300. Audi's A6 at about 57,000 for the 4 liter turbo equipped car goes up to a little bit higher at 64,000 for the 3 liter turbo with similar amount of power as this. And once you option it out with similar features to the Caddy, you're up at just under 78,000. And that's a turbo car, so you have to run much more expensive premium gas in it, whereas the Cadillac takes a regular 87 octane go juice. So if I were shopping for a car in this segment, I think the CTS would actually really be a strong contender for my dollars. It's loaded with technology and features. It looks as good, if not better, than its competition. And the driving dynamics are really top notch. I might just become a Cadillac man yet.
open this installment of Motoring News by talking about Formula One for a little bit. Now, both Jeremy and I are fans, have been for a long time, but Formula One is in a bit of a sad state. It's, it's lost its way, and there are problems both with the rules and the governance of the sport. You know, F1 used to be about the most technologically advanced cars, real unique solutions to things that engineers would come up with, and the best and most talented drivers in those cars. And while the cars now are still you know, fairly advanced in some ways, the rules have also really limited them in where they can make those advances and in how much development they can do in those cars. Um, you know, they've got this really weird token system that limits what they can do to the car and how much they can do. Um, so it really holds back a lot of teams, especially some of the teams that are less competitive and, you know, further back in the pack, really can't catch up. Um, so it, it really, you know, they're, they're struggling to solve this problem. And in order to try to bring some excitement back to racing, which has really lacked due to, you know, not enough wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, not enough passing, you know, this is a complaint that both the drivers and the fans have had. So what the powers that be have decided to come up with are things like the DRS, the drag reduction system which basically allows the car following another to gain a lot of speed and pass very easily. And the car in front really can't do anything to stop it. has no option to stop it. No, so there really is nothing there for driver talent to compete. It's just an artificial system to introduce some passing and try to artificially create excitement. Um, but as fans, we don't like that. I don't like DRS. I think it's dumb. I think most fans would agree. So... We don't want artificial solutions, and I think really the solution to the problem is very simple. What we need is less aerodynamic downforce on these cars and a lot more mechanical grip so these guys can get close to each other and race. So for 2017, which we were hoping we would get those solutions, although we are seeing a big improvement in mechanical grip, they're also increasing wing width, which means that it will increase aero, downforce, which will still hamper cars from passing and falling close behind. My thought on this is to take away a great amount of the aero downforce. Increase it with wider tires, really focus on mechanical grip, and allow room for innovation in suspension technology. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe allow adjustable suspension so that the cars yeah. can utilize ground effects. Yeah. Um, like a lot of the road cars now with the very active suspensions. That's right. F1 cars should have that too. Exactly. But to complicate this, we come to the problem of F1's management, where we have a draconian troll that basically is just whoring the sport for money. Pretty much. And completely denies the teams to, to do a great deal of innovation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if the solution is as simple as getting rid of Bernie. I mean, I never thought I'd hear myself say, bring back Max Mosley. Yeah. I mean, even though he was nuttier than a fruitcake, at least we had great racing. Yeah. I um, think that's part of the problem is... You know, Jean taught all respect to the man as a, you know, team principal. I think as, you know, a leader of the FIA, he's trying to be too inclusive. He's trying to give everybody a voice in the decision-making process. Yeah. And I think that's what's causing a big part of the problem. There's nobody making a decision. No, no. And even in this most recent months, the Drivers Association issued a letter of complaint that was very vague and yeah. almost kind. You know, it, we need to stand up, we need to demand true evolution of the sport. Yeah. And that includes the teams, the team principals, and the drivers. Yeah. I mean, we've got a situation where all the teams have to unanimously agree to changes. And with so many different teams and so many different agendas and politics in play, how do you get, you know, 11, 12 teams to agree? No. It's, it's too much of a problem. So, you know, I, for one, I'm losing interest in F1, and I think a lot of others, too. You know, I think, really, F1 needs to pull its collective 
head out of its derriere, get its act together, make some real changes, and find some direction again soon, or I think it really risks becoming irrelevant. Agreed. On to more positive news. Bentley has just uh, released press information um, that they're launching an updated uh, Bentley Continental GT Speed and Black Edition. Uh, the 6 liter twin turbo W12 now produces 633 horsepower and 619 pound feet of torque, launching the car to 100 kilometers an hour in 4.1 seconds. The Black Edition adds all black paint and black wheels with red cal brake calipers. Well, for How? an extra, what, 25,000 bucks or something? Oh, come on, <laughs> pish, posh. That's, that's <laughs> nothing if you're buying a Bentley. Um, <laughs> available are contrast colors for the front splitter, side skirts, and the rear diffuser. So you can get a little creative with, with trim okay, and that makes all the difference. And lots of carbon fiber trim on the inside. Uh, they're telling us, order yours now for delivery starting this summer. I'll get right on that. Um, a lot of high-performance sports cars now are not coming with manual transmissions. You know, a good old manual gearbox is becoming a rarity. But Aston Martin is going to help us out by introducing a 7-speed manual as an available option in the V12 Vantage S. Um, they do add some extra technology as well with their AmShift system which uses sensors in the clutch, in the gear position, and the prop shaft to match engine revs and mimic a heel and toe shift. So you don't have to be a good heel and toe shifter yourself, the car is going to help you out. Also with the Vantage S, they're introducing a new Sports Plus Pack option, which offers some new color combinations and wheels. And if the Vantage S isn't good enough for you, they've introduced a brand new car called the Vantage GT8. And this is a race bread beast, they say, that offers customers less weight, lots of carbon fiber bits, and excellent aerodynamics. Um, power is going to come from a revised 440 horsepower 4.7 liter V8, um, available also with a 6-speed manual or a 7-speed uh, paddle shift automatic. Um, the car it looks really aggressive. It actually looks pretty cool. Um, you know, they've got different body work on it. It's very aero focused. Mm -hmm. Looks a lot like the um, GTE race car, which it gets its inspiration from. Um, looks really aggressive with the carbon fiber front splitter, side sills, rear diffuser. Um, and there's cool cutaways at the back of the front wheel arches, like you find on the race cars. So it's, it's a really sharp looking car. Um, and then you can also get an optional aero pack, which gives you extra little aero doodads on the corners of the front splitter right. and a big rear wing. So if you can actually track the car, you, know, you get a little extra aerodynamic downforce there. Um, there's also new wheel options, and the cars are going to wear really sticky Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires. And then there's further weight savings achieved using a polycarbonate rear window and um, rear side windows, uh, a titanium center-mounted exhaust, and a bunch of carbon fiber inside on door panels, carbon fiber manually adjustable sport seats. And overall, they say they've dropped about 220 pounds from the car. So if I get this right, following Geneva, we have a lightweight 911 in the GT3. Mm -hmm. We have a lightweight Corvette coming. Mm -hmm. Now a lightweight Vantage. Yeah. Am I missing anything? No. Nope. Pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, my only concern is I don't think we're going to see that car in North America. Because I think some of the things like the bumpers and splitters... The polycarbonate windows probably won't meet our safety standards. So, mm. yeah, I think you Europeans and Asians and Middle Eastern customers are going to be happy, and we North Americans might be left out in the cold. Out. So, we'll try not to cry too much. Well, this might be cold comfort, but let's move on to uh, this beauty Ford's track ready Shelby GT350 Mustang. Not a bad um, machine. Not a bad machine. The car is getting some more standard features for 2017. Um, three new colors are available, including ruby red metallic, deep impact blue, and competition orange. Uh, along with the back seat option that Ford started offering at the end of last year, uh, the car now includes an aluminum strut tower brace, high downforce deck lid spoiler, engine oil, transmission and differential coolers, and the Magna Ride damping system. Nice. Um, also available as an option to replace the manual Recaro seats with leather trim power sports seats. Very nice. So you'll be styling. 
You've heard of Ken Block. It sounds vaguely familiar. And you've heard of Ken Block. And if you haven't, get out from underneath the rock you're living under and get on the internet because you need to know who Ken Block is. Uh, all kidding aside, the internet was it exploded last week uh, when video was released of Ken Block's new FIA Rally Cross Ford Focus with its new really wild uh, paint livery. Um, Hoonigan collaborated with artist Philippe Pantone to come up with a unique and striking livery, and that's an understatement. Um, Pantone layered the art on canvas using different spray paints. The art was then digitized and made into a wrap that was then placed on Ken's car and his teammate's car. Uh, the result is described as a kinetic mix of geometric patterns, bold colors, and intricate fades conveying speed and motion. Ooh, speed and ah. motion. All I can say is it's badass. So It does look nice. It's pretty cool. It's pretty trick. Uh, Ken's car in a pr primarily white and black livery, and his teammate's car is black and gray. Um, the Ford Focus that uh, the Ken will be racing, no longer the Fiesta, uh, has a 600 horsepower and 663 pound-feet of torque Ford EcoBoost uh, motor, um, all the same super technological WRC uh, transmission uh, drive system. Uh, the car is going to debut on April 17th in Montalegre, Portugal when uh, round one of the FIA World Rally Cross Championship opens. Excellent. And that's the news. <clears throat> so today we begin Project Lemon Jetta. We're going to try to do a few things before the sun goes down. We're going to tear out the interior and get as much of that out as we can and see if we can get the tranny out to do the clutch repair. So uh, let the games begin. Um, what's that rule for the lemons where you can sell off parts of the car? Yeah, if um, you can sell parts of the car, the money you make, it goes in your favor against the $700 limit. Yeah, do you think that applies to stuff we find in the car? I would say so. What well, you there's a pretty <laughs> glass pipe. <laughs> Figure I could get 10 bucks for that? Yeah, yeah. All right. Craigslist gets going. <laughs> Count against the total. put these really long Allen head bolts in to hold the speakers in obviously went to the dumbassery school of stereo installation because really Just a little bit. I guess that's for the emergency backup Fred Flintstone braking system. Yes, yes. So let me pull the pad on the other side and just see if it's as bad.
I've got the interior now pretty much all out of the car. Uh, the only thing left is the dash in preparation for it to go to Steve's shop and get the cage put in it. Um, there's a bit of house cleaning to do and I'm going to do some trim panels and stuff that will look cool, but uh, for the most part, we got all stripped out and next stop will be Steve's shop and the cage put in it. What I find angers me most now when I'm driving is tailgaters, speeders, people driving recklessly with this incessant need to go somewhere a hell of a lot faster than they should be. And for what? To get to the job that you hate five minutes earlier? We're all going to die. However, some of you are going to go before the rest of us. My message to you is just stop chill out, and quit acting like idiots and morons. We drive because we enjoy the act of driving. And you can't enjoy the act of driving when you're constantly on the defensive, looking for that next idiot to come along and involve you in their tragedy. So please, everybody, let's slow down, let's enjoy the drive, and let's save some lives.